morning all uh, welcome to the uh, lecture by uh, michael w street on the role of police sketch artist during criminal investigation and uh, this session uh, is going from now before starting the session as we all know whole world is uh, fighting with the corona so first i salute all the corona warriors on behalf of sherlock institute of forensic science and also sketch cop academy uh, usa where the michael is ceo so welcome michael uh, for the session and thank you for accepting our invitation for the session thank you for having me yeah so i just uh, tell a brief about the michael you all must have read about the michael because he is a very popular man so michael is a retired sergeant uh, um, an award winning internationally uh, recognized forensic facial imaging expert based in uh, los angeles baltimore washington dc and metropolitan area for the last four decades michael has combined uh, his extensive law enforcement experience and considered all skills to provide forensic facial imaging services to the largest most diverse police agencies in the united states including the baltimore and los angeles police Depart uh, departments at baltimore police department he first ever full time ia certified forensic artist michael was tasked with the building their fo uh, forensic facial imaging unit from the ground up once established he handled all the country busiest case for distinguished his unit to first its kind of iso 17020 accredited laboratory Michael currently a member of several professional organization organization like International Association for Identification California Homicide Investigator Association California Robbery Investigation Investigator Association California Start uh, Sexual Assault Investigators Association International Homicide Investigators Association uh, in 2015 Michael uh, converted Baltimore Police Department a forensic facial imaging unit to Uh, an online operation the first ever uh, first major police agency in the country to do so uh, today he remains the police forensic artist providing his remote services with the same efficiency and if, uh, and if he has still on site uh, more about michael you can read on this uh, link you will find all the details he, his bio is very very long so cutting short i'm just uh, moving towards the i am welcoming all the participant from the uh, 40 plus countries 23 plus people we have attending the uh, online meetings along with the webinar and the youtube facebook live 400 organization participating in this people from afghanistan australia bangladesh botswana brazil uh, canada ethiopia uk us uae oman whole uh, uh, world the people have joined and welcome this series in a uh, such a way i'm just going to thank you few uh, persons who have helped me in this organizing this wonderful lecture so i like to thank adj kulkarni sir from the cpr uh, sp anand boyte sir from the cpr uh, gulneer singh kurana ips from punjab police narendra rajania from haryana police ips officer ashok kumar meena ips officer uh, dr ketan patel sir ips officer uh, salona s kumar meen sir ips officers so uh, i like to thank all the police department people who have joined in our uh, lecture forensic science laboratory colleges university all states police and the cid departments uh, nigerian police botswana police sarja police and list is many more so uh, cutting short i am just handing over session to the michael michael uh, now stage is yours you can start your session welcome everybody thank you for uh, taking the time to attend our meeting tonight in our lecture on the role of police sketch artists during criminal investigations i know i'm been excited about it and i hope you are too and tonight uh, or actually tonight it's tonight in california here but it's um probably morning afternoon or evening wherever you are in the world but um that being what it is uh, we want to talk about uh, you know some of your expectations and and dispel some of the rumors about what police sketch artists actually do and uh, you know a lot of you are either police sketch artists yourself already or you're interested in becoming one uh, much like I did so what i'm going to do is um share my screen with you and i'm going to uh, show you some slides and hopefully we'll have some time for some uh, software demonstration uh, but i want to talk to you about um my role and what your role will be 
as a police sketch artist. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Again, like he had explained, um, I am a retired police sergeant. I'm just gonna kind of go over my background with you again, because there's a couple of um, things I wanna add to what Dr. Singh had already said. I am a retired police sergeant. I do have 34 years of active law enforcement experience uh, with extensive investigation experience. Out of the 34 years I spent uh, in law enforcement, uh, three years was spent as a police sketch artist in the crime laboratory with the Baltimore Police Department as their first ever full-time sketch artist. And then uh, 10 years out of my 31 year police career is, was spent as a detective in various assignments, violent crimes, property crimes, gang unit, uh, juvenile uh, sexual assault and child abuse types of crimes. I have uh, 40 years of experience as a police sketch artist and uh, 900 plus almost a thousand hours of specialized classroom training. I helped cre create the FBI's first uh, composite art and photo retouching course. And I've been a consultant trainer for several facial imaging software companies, which we'll talk about because uh, I'm really big into a software driven solution for uh, police departments in terms of creating composite sketches. And again, uh, not only do I work for the Baltimore City Police Department, but I also work for the Los Angeles Police Department. Uh, now through my company, when I retired from the police department, I went ahead and started my company, Sketch Cop Solutions. And the goal of the company was to offer uh, training and support for law enforcement agencies that were looking for forensic facial imaging solutions. So with that, uh, we incorporated in 2007 and we're located in California, just south of Los Angeles. And we provide consultative services and forensic facial imaging services, products, and training some of the services we'll talk about. We do have a training facility, the Sketch Cop Academy in Orange County, California. And we also run the Sketch Cop Online Academy as well because distance learning is a big thing now, especially in the uh, age of COVID-19. As we all know, that's pretty much changed everything in terms of how we learn, how we train, how we interact with one another. And we'll talk about some uh, some of the remote work that I do, um, but uh, we are moving to an online model, so we will be able to um, develop um, training for a lot of people who are interested. The great thing is, is because we are in such an interconnected world and we do have uh, attendees tonight from so many different countries, uh, the ability, uh, the things we've developed in terms of online learning, online meeting and stuff like that, it doesn't matter if, you're in, if I'm in Los Angeles here. Um, I've trained police agencies online uh, in Paraguay, in the Philippines. I've been to Ghana uh, to, to instruct and to teach in West Africa. So um, as long as we have airplanes and as long as we have internet and such, there's no reason why we can't reach out and um, interact with one another and learn from one another. So. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, part of my uh, part of my trying to create better understanding into what a police sketch artist does is through writing books and writing journal articles and such. So, while this may seem like kind of a you know infomercial, you know I do want to share some resources with you because. Uh, when we talk about being a police sketch artist, it's, it's kind of an anomaly because there's not a lot of active ones around. A lot of the people that are doing it are doing it as a um, secondary job. They may be a detective or they may be a, a crime scene officer and they only do sketches when they're called upon to do it. And because I spent so many years uh, effectively being a full-time sketch artist, uh, it was important for me to document some of my stories in terms of some of the difficult crimes I've handled, and hopefully by some of the difficulties I had to overcome, those that are coming into the business, uh, I don't want to say won't have to work so hard, uh, but you'll have some, some, some life, um, life rings or lifesavers to hang on to and such and some uh, ways to help you across the, uh, through the weeds there, so to speak. And then of course, um, because we're entering a digital age and we're gonna talk about traditional sketch artists versus, versus uh, digital sketch artists, it's important to understand the digital tools that are out there and how to create faces uh, as a traditional artist using digital software uh, as well as a software-driven solution for creating facial composites. 
So Sketch Cop Drawing a Line Against Crime pretty much covers the history and the background of sketch artistry and then goes into some uh, difficult cases I've handled in terms of serial killers, serial rapists, uh, you know, some difficult eyewitnesses and some difficult challenges, interviewing children, older people and such. So that's that. Um, also, we developed uh, the Sketch Cop face, uh, Facial Composite System software. You can see the laptop here with the with the composite here, um, we realized that um, that as we moved into a digital age, and you know, composite sketch software isn't anything that's new or unique. It's they've had it since I first started in police work back in the mid '70s, if not earlier. But when they started digitizing it, you know, we wanted to be the, the, at the forefront of it, and so you know, we're really heavily involved in developing this digital solution so we can increase the ranks of sketch artists, so to speak, or people that want to create sketches and such. So we've got that. Also, training is a big component of what we do uh, through the Sketch Cop Academy at the Balmer Institute in Orange County, California, uh, just down the road from Disneyland, so we're close to the Magic Kingdom. Um, but then, of course, we also have the Sketch Cop Academy online at sketchcopacademy.com. We do have some courses up there now and some re some free resources and such. You want to cruise on over there and take a look and sign up while you're there. Um, but again, you know, all these years of experience and the opportunity to mentor under people has brought me here today to be with you because, um, you know, when I first started, I needed somebody and, um, there wasn't a lot of classes, a lot of training, a lot of people willing to help when I first started, and I'm grateful. So it's now it's it's an opportunity to pay back. But probably the thing I'm most excited about is part of being here with you online today is the relationship that we've built with the Sherlock Institute of Forensic Sciences uh, with Dr. Singh. Um, as you can see, the handshake graphic here and the arrows pointing going around in almost a square or a circle, um, you know, we've um, entered into this relationship uh, to be able to uh, deliver services in terms of, you know, facial composites, post-mortem imaging, facial reconstruction, age progression, one-to-one -one photo comparison and analysis, as well as some training in facial composites and eyewitness interview some of the stuff we're planning on doing in a collaboration together uh, to bring that to your region in that part of the world. So I'm really, really excited about that. And this is uh, really pretty much the way I see it is the jump off point is, is that we're, you know, this is the first step in a long uh, list of projects that uh, Dr. Singh and I will be collaborating on and bringing to all of you here soon. So stand by for that. Um, you know, we'll be reaching out and get in touch and uh, let you know about that as it develops and stuff. So I'm really excited about that. So tonight, our objective, like any training, and of course this isn't a class, it's more of a lecture, but I wanna uh, at least try to set some parameters while we're here. So um, if we had to state what our mission is for tonight, what is our objective? And basically it's to make the attendees, yourselves, all aware of the role that police sketch artists play during criminal investigations and the value that they add as an investigative resource. I mean, there's so many things that we do and there's so many things that I've done and there's so many things that you'll find out that you can do as you go through this journey. Some of the things we want to talk about in terms of our learning domains tonight is we want to set the ground rules, so to speak, in terms of the way we use certain terms and definitions, the public perception of police sketch artists, as well as the media perception of police sketch artists. I'll provide you my expert analysis. We'll talk about the different types of forensic facial imaging that um, not only myself, but some of you who are listening in who are sketch artists already or forensic artists. Um, may already do and some of you probably like I was the more you learned the more you wanted to learn you conquer one area you want to go tackle another one and of course um, I'll give you my final thoughts uh, where I see the industry going at least the way I hope it goes as well and then we'll take some questions and um, part as friends and uh, hopefully stay in touch hopefully that sounds good to you I'm excited so here we go so first, 
first off, we wanted to talk about the terms. I use um, police sketch artists as a generic term to describe, you know, what we do. That's why, you know, when I when I started out as the sketch cop, you know, I, I had to think of something that would describe what I did. People would always ask me, well, you know, what do you do? I said, well, I, I'm a, I sketch pictures of bad guys. I finally sat and I went to go, oh, sketch cop. Okay, that, that sounds good. I'm a cop. I was a, I was a police officer at the time that sketched. So the name stuck and, and here I am. Um, but I'm, you know, kind of old school in a way that I first started, like I say, 40 years ago and, and everyone called someone who sketch criminals, a police sketch artist. Um, a group of folks got together and decided they wanted to elevate it. And um, because, you know, the, the work that they did was basically, and the, the work that we did, I should say, was forensically related and, uh, you know, had to do with the legal system that they would call themselves forensic artists. And that was during the time that they were first recognized and they're starting out a group with the International Association for Identification, so that name stuck. So you'll still hear, you'll still hear, you'll, I'm sorry, you'll still hear a police sketch, sketch artist. You may hear composite sketch artist or police composite artist, which is what they call us, it's our official name at the Los Angeles Police Department, or police composite artist, a forensic sketch artist, and if you're in the Philippines, a cartographic sketch artist. I've been really, a um, little sidebar note here, I always like to look up and see what people are doing in other parts of the world. I think um, I'm always, you know, I've been, you know, retired from police work in terms of driving around a police car for about 12 years now, and I still miss the job, and I still, you know, love what I did, and, and I'm, I'm thankful to still be able to be part of the team, so to speak, by helping police detectives still with their cases and such. Um, but I always like to look at uh, different country police departments' websites and you know, read the police blotter, you know, whether it's in India or Africa or, you know, Japan or wherever. I always like to look at the police pages, and look and see what type of crimes uh, that there are out there. And, you know, the circumstances are always the same. They may call it something else in terms of the, the name of the, the type of crime. But when you look at the elements of the crime, so to speak, they're, you know, pretty much the same all, all the way around. And, uh, I always then, then after I do that, I start looking for the composite sketches that are drawn by different artists or different people uh, from the different agencies around the world. And I find out that, you know, we're all interconnected in the way that, you know, a lot of agencies are using uh, sketch artists or they're using some sort of software driven solution to, um, you know, create their composites and such. Some agencies don't use it at all. Uh, some of you may not use it at all. Some of you may be listening in here to find out what exactly this is all about and how you can get started and how you can get your police department uh, to do it as well. So the, I threw that cartographic uh, sketch artist in there because um, I thought it was pretty, uh, a pretty cool name. Uh, they use a software-driven solution in the Philippines. Um, I found out in Tokyo, Japan, Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department has a squad of about 30 police sketch artists, which is probably one of the biggest sketch artist units in the world. At the Los Angeles Police Department, where I work, there's only two of us for a city of four million people uh, who are on call. And of course, I work for Baltimore as well, so I'm the only one there. So um, it's exciting to hear about how, about how other agencies do it. I'm, and I'm hoping uh, that after this lecture tonight, that you'll reach out to me too, and we can exchange information. I'd like to hear more about what you do, and I can share what I do and how we get the job done, so to speak. Um, so, you know, so tonight, just for simplicity's sake, I'll be using the term police sketch artist to describe any one of these. So if you are one of these, um, I call police sketch artists, I'm talking about you. So also, um, I've been putting a lot of training together lately and I keep coming across the term victim and eyewitness and I, I, I kept listing victim, eyewitness, eyewitness victim. And I thought, you know, when I start talking about this, I want to kind of put this to, to, to bed right away and say that when I refer to an eyewitness uh, anytime tonight, I'm also talking about a victim because a victim is always an eyewitness of some sort. If they didn't see the suspect, they might have heard them, uh, smelled something, um, you know, used any one of their senses to somehow bear witness to the crime they were the victim of. 
but an eyewitness isn't necessarily always a victim. So if I'm talking about an eyewitness, I'm talking about someone who's not only just a victim, but not a victim as well. So that way you don't think I'm forgetting about victims when I'm talking about uh, doing sketches and such. So we're here tonight to talk about police composite sketches. So let's uh, talk about what a police composite sketch is. So uh, this is from the, I started to write courtesy of, and I, I meant to put the, this is courtesy of the International Association for Identifications, Standards and Guidelines for Forensic Artists. Um, if you guys haven't uh, thought about it, any of you who are already police sketch artists, and you're looking to get certified, uh, you can go to the IAI's webpage uh, at www.theiai.org and look for forensic art certification and see if you have the uh, necessary uh, training and experience to uh, take the test and get certified, or if you're really interested in becoming certified and you're not quite there yet, you can start uh, guiding your training and some of your work towards becoming certified. So I was one of the members of the first certification committees uh, back in the 90s and such. And um, there's, it's always, it's a, it's a nice thing to have to say that you're certified, especially when you go into court and such. So um, this is from the standards and guidelines. So the term composite uh, should be used when referring to any facial or full body image of a person, or I'm sorry, of a suspect or person of interest assembled with the assistance of an eyewitness Irrespective of the technique, technique used in this production, in other words, it doesn't matter if it's hand sketched by an artist or someone who's a non-artist uses software to put it together, it's still considered composite. So um, the aim of providing a good composite image is to produce a visual aid that will bring about recognition of the person of interest. It doesn't necessarily mean that that person is the suspect. They could be a person of interest. They could be an eyewitness. Um, so course here's the note here the term composite means made up of various component parts or blended so it's almost like um, putting together pieces of a puzzle so to speak or simply stated uh, one of my mentors uh, when I asked him what he thought a composite was he basically told me it was a graphic representation of a person's basic facial characteristics pretty much you know, you're trying to catch the, the generality of a person's face and hopefully if you catch something that's special, um, it, it's something drawn. Um, so now, when I first started out, um, I'll go back and tell a little story here. Uh, I didn't start out, uh, I didn't consider myself an artist, so to speak. I mean, I wanted to be an animator with the, uh, the Walt Disney Corporation to make Mickey Mouse movies. I was a cartoonist. I, I hadn't even drawn a human face. And I was hired by the police department and I just like catching bad guys. I wanted to find another way to catch bad guys. So um, I couldn't figure out how to do it until I saw a composite sketch on the news one night. And so I called um, LAPD the Los Angeles Police Department talked to their artist, found he was giving a class, took his class, uh, loved it. I was hooked. Uh, then I found an ad in the FBI magazine about a class they were giving in terms of uh, they wanted to put a course together. So um, I applied and was selected and, and took part in this planning and got to go to the training. And, and so I just start hopscotching around the country, uh, the United States and Canada, finding out who the best people were and um, studying under them. We didn't have online courses then. We didn't have um, distance learning. We had to get on a plane and fly and go somewhere and spend a week or two away from home sometimes. And so the FBI was you know, really one of the precursors, one of the first agencies here in the United States that used uh, sketch artists on a consistent basis and trained others around the country, around the world actually. Unfortunately, they don't give the course anymore, but they train hundreds of sketch artists um, in their technique. And so um, it just kind of went from there to where I am today. And, and I don't know about you guys, but you know, I can only speak here in the United States. And of course, I'd love to hear your stories as well in terms of how you know, some of the farthest 
some of the oldest cases your uh, country, your police agency has been involved in. But this slide right here represents a terrorist bombing on Wall Street in New York City back in 1920, about 100 years ago. And here's a sketch of the person who was alleged to have committed this bombing. And back then, they didn't have the training that we have now. They just grabbed the nearest sketch artist. And in this case, it was a cartoonist for the New York Times newspaper. And they would set them down in front of somebody and, and, and have them sketch. They didn't know anything about trauma. They didn't know anything about eyewitness identification. They didn't know anything about um, you know, cognitive uh, psychology or anything. They just got the best description they could and put a sketch out. And in the 30s, uh, and I should take a step back. The object of showing you these slides of these uh, cases, just to kind of give you an idea, at least in, in the United States here, how far back the use of police sketches are in some of the top cases uh, that you may or may not have heard of in international news and such, or going back in the history books, this is Charles Lindbergh, who uh, flew across the Atlantic in the spirit of St. Louis. He had a baby that was kidnapped. And again, you know, a composite sketch was created. And this person here on the right, Bruno Hoppman, was arrested and uh, tried and convicted and hanged for the um, kidnapping and, and killing of Charles Lindbergh's baby. Again, these sketches go way back, famous cases, non-famous cases. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of history here in this profession. The assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King in 1968. Um, my mentor, one of my first mentors, drew this sketch of uh, the killer. Here, James Earl Ring. The Night Stalker from the 80s. Every decade has its notorious killer that their sketch is done of, and some sketches probably you've never seen. Uh, this was the sketch that um, one of my other mentors created, and here's the sketch of the suspect who recently died in prison. Uh, most people are familiar with the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski. Most recently, the Golden State Killer, this person uh, was a former police officer, a serial rapist and murderer, uh, who's... Um, criminal career span 40 years and they recently caught him with DNA or, or I should say through DNA. Another view of him, there were dozens of composites done of this person and um, this is one of them right here. He had several different looks. Again, 40 years is a long time for a criminal to be out there. A lot of sketches, a lot of different appearance changes. So... Now those were those were really um, those were sketches done by experienced police sketch artists. Those were high-profile cases that made international headlines, and those are the kind of cases you may be called to work on. You may be um, you may get a call uh, to sketch a crime that no one will ever hear about. You may be called to sketch a crime that makes not only national news in your country, but also international news around the world. And there's a lot of pressure in those cases. And so, you know, part of the um, misconception in terms of how we work and how this all works is um, that we work like fine artists. So we just kind of stand there to easel and we leisurely draw pictures, we leisurely paint pictures. And in a perfect world, I guess that would be fine. But in my experience, um, interviewing uh, Eyewitnesses, I've interviewed people in the comfort of my office. I've interviewed them in the back seats of cars, in the back of restaurants. I had a victim choke me one night. I had a, a, another victim offer to sell me narcotics. Uh, I've had a woman tear a page on my sketchbook and, and scribble all over it, telling me how horrible an artist I was. Um, I wish I had the luxury of drawing in peace sometimes, but this is a very fluid dynamic thing that we're doing as sketch artists because we're dealing with people and no two people are going to react the same. So you don't always have those peaceful moments like this artist depicted here that can leisurely just stand there and, and paint for pleasure. You know, there's no pleasure in doing the kind of art that we do because every time the phone rings or every time someone comes to get you to do a sketch, it's because someone's been hurt or someone's in distress. 
The media also, they spend more time these days making fun of sketches than they do urging you to look for somebody. And, you know, it's partially our fault um, because uh, sometimes we think that we have enough training and we don't always have enough training. I sketch every day. Every day, if, if I don't finish a drawing, I'm working on a, on a sketch that I'm trying to finish and practice techniques on. Um, so when that phone does ring, I can do the best job I can. So if you're not drawing every day, you should be. Um, you know, making up a face uh, out of your mind, um, you know, taking a picture somewhere and, and copying it. Um, I had a friend of mine that uh, worked for the San Jose Police Department, very good sketch artist, and he said he draws every day. I've got it, other friends or are, are artists, they draw every day, I draw every day. So uh, it's like almost like going to the gym, you know, except for, you know, you're doing curls with like a half ounce pencil or stylus or something, you're just, you know, uh, putting pen to paper, pencil to paper, and, and practicing. Um, now, this sketch got the job done. Uh, an officer saw this sketch and thought of this guy, and he was identified. Uh, but this person was just made fun of in the media. So they've gotten used to some of those old-school, famous sketch artists that were fine artists, that practiced, that had very good skills. And um, they, I think the expectations are, are, are too high. So I think in some cases, it's up to us to rise the occasion so we don't fall into this trap. Now, um, not picking on India here. Um, India is really interesting because um, I, uh, I have a lot of Indian friends and I started looking up uh, doing some research into police work in India. And India is one of the, um, one of the few countries in the world that uses police sketches on a routine basis. Um, they've got some great sketch artists there that have a lot of experience, have done thousands of sketches, they're famous in the media. Um, but I think sometimes the media doesn't always get it right. So if you look at this uh, 2017 Times of India article, it was titled Police Sketch, not a, not a Picture Perfect Tool to Crack All Criminal Cases. So they're already setting you up for the expectation that the police sketches aren't Aren't, they have no value as a crime fighting tool. However, if I were to reimagine an article myself, I would title it Police Sketch, a picture perfect tool to crack criminal cases because in my experience, um, people do a very good job. Uh, eyewitnesses and police, police sketch artists do a very good job at the contributions to these investigations uh, that they're called uh, to, to work in. And, and again, like I said, I could tell you some stories, but um, you know, we don't always work under the most optimal conditions. So what I want to do is I want to kind of go through here and uh, talk about some of the points um, that, they, um, that they talk about here on uh, about how a sketch is made. Um, so um, we'll go ahead and get started. So the first point that they made was that police sketches are used in cases where there's a lack of other evidence to identify suspects and, and murder victims. And that's true. Um, and, and you know that they believe that that's true because of the Indian police doing so many sketches and putting them out in the news media. They really know how to use sketches. Um, they, don't, they don't get them and bury them in some case file. They, they put them out there in the Times of India. They put them out in the other news outlets and such. Uh, they treat them with the importance and the respect that they deserve. Uh, because when you, when you don't have any other evidence um, and you, you've got an eyewitness, it, it almost demands and screams that you do a sketch. Um, even if there is evidence, you may want to do a sketch. It may be that you've got a fingerprint, you've got some DNA, you've got some tool marks, but it's going to take months you know, to analyze that or keep running the evidence for matches in the fingerprint system or the DNA system it would be better to put out a sketch and have someone give you a name of a suspect and then do a one-to-one -one match. It would be to wait. So uh, police sketches are not only used in cases uh, where there's a lack of evidence, but again, where there is evidence. Uh, number two, it's after a, uh, an FIR, first information report is registered and the need for the portrait is determined, the station house officer sends a request to the state crime records bureau director to request a sketch. So the first information report would be if your patrol officer goes out and takes 
uh, report from a crime victim, like a robbery or something like that. Um, then again, and the inspector thinks it's worth doing a sketch and they get the ball rolling and such. So it seems like an onerous process. It should be the, uh, the detective that um, requests, I mean, if they, think, if they think it should be done, it should be a less labor intensive process, but you know, it is what it is. Um, uh, but thankfully they do have a process in place for, for doing them and other agencies have similar processes and such. So, um, but we want to encourage and make it as easy as possible. If you are a decision maker and you're attending tonight or today, um, you know, you want to make it as easy for the detectives, your investigators to uh, make a request for a sketch. So now um, the witness is going to sit with the policeman or police officer, police person uh, to assist him or her while drawing the portrait on the software called the CPBS, which is the color portrait building system, which is um, a widely used composite system there in India. And uh, this software program is a palette with about 3,800 3, sample images, noses, eyes, hairstyles, things like that, uh, which make it simpler to draw the portrait. Um, yeah, it, it seems like it would be easier to draw um, or to create a composite, a uh, software-driven composite, when there's a, a wide sampling of images and such. But sometimes less is more. Sometimes having less images but good software editing tools is important. And the witness is asked to describe specific facial features like round noses or thin eyebrows. And um, this is what, um, whether it's a... Um, a software-driven solution where you're using a, a, a software system like the uh, color portrait building system or any other ones, it's going to be important to do a good interview. Um, interview is, is, is what is the most important thing you'll do. Um, you know, people talk about, you know, how well they draw, how computer savvy they are, uh, but you have to be a good listener too. You have to be a good interviewer to be able to get the, um, write information and create the sketch. Otherwise it just becomes one of your drawings. So um, the sketch created using options in the palette. Um, you know, the, the more tools you have to refine the sketch, uh, the better. And it usually takes three to four hours to complete a portrait. I'm not quite sure um, where they got that time down from because there's, in my experience, I usually take an hour to an hour and a half. Um, people are busy these days and you know, they're going to school they're working, they have short attention spans. You have to be able to get in and do the sketch um, as expediently as possible. Um, three to four hours to me seems to be a long time if you're using a computer system and all the parts are already created for you and you're just putting the parts together. Um, three to four hours, the victim's gonna get tired, they're gonna wanna go home, they're gonna wanna eat and such. So um, I've heard sketch artists say that they spend four to five hours. And um, you know, these are concept sketches out of someone's memory. Um, they're not meant to be like fine art portraits worthy of hanging in the national galleries and such in a museum. Uh, they're, sim they're simple concept sketches. You're constructing something based upon from some, somebody's words. Um, three to four hours. Um, there should never be a time limit on it. Um, but, you know, if you're having trouble with somebody, maybe break that three or four hours up to an hour and a half one day and they haven't come back and finish it the next day. There's a lot of other things um, that you can that you can do to uh, maximize your interview. Uh, but again, that's for a later course in, in, in interviewing interview strategies and things like that. Because when you're interviewing somebody, uh, there's a strategy to it. Uh, no two people are going to be interviewed the same way. You may have a structure set up for how you want to interview somebody, how you want to talk to somebody. Um, but somebody comes in and they flip the script because uh, they're highly traumatized or they're not as traumatized as you thought they'd be, or they um, are really upset and they're crying a lot or they're angry and such. So you have to kind of, you know, change your, your, um, your strategy in terms of how you talk to them and how long you talk to them. Uh, but if, if I were to take that three to four hours, I would say, you know, I'd spend a good 30 minutes um, building rapport and getting to know somebody. And um, again, you know, this is one of those um, things in your role as a police sketch artist. Uh, the biggest thing you have to remember your role as a police sketch artist is not about you. Um, I checked my ego at the door a long time ago. I tell people, you know, 
I'm working for you today. Um, if I want to go home and do and draw pretty pictures, I'll do it off the job, so to speak, you know, uh, but you know, for them, I'll draw it for them. I'm providing a service. Uh, I'm providing something for them and I'll take as long as I need. I'll get to know them as long as I can. Uh, but again, if it starts wearing on through the afternoon or a whole day and stuff like that, then you have to kind of take a step back and rethink it and such. So we want to get the sketch. We want to catch the bad guy, but we want to do it right. I'll give you an example. Um, I get a lot of sexual assault victim uh, sketches um, and they'll, the person's been kidnapped. They've been sexually assaulted. They haven't eaten. They haven't anything to drink. They go to the doctor. They have an invasive examination done. They take them back to the police station. They talk to the detectives. They've been awake for over 24 hours, and then they drop them in front of me, and I have to sketch them. Now, am I going to keep them another three or four hours? Probably not. So um, just keep in mind um, you know, the role we play. Um, there are many. Uh, but being a good listener and being an, an active listener is, is one of the biggest things uh, to remember that will make you a successful sketch artist. So that being said, what's my take on this? What's the sketch cop's view on the role of a police sketch artist? Uh, I look at what we do as being uh, consultative. We're like a consultant. You know, they, most knowledge that police detectives have of uh, composite sketches, if they're not a sketch artist themselves, is what is passed along to them from other detectives, from other police, their own experience with sketches. They don't necessarily need to know, or they even, a lot of times they don't even want to know how you do it, how it gets done. They just want it done. But sometimes, as a, as a uh, in your consultative role, as a police sketch artist, you're going to want to provide some expert opinion. Now, you don't necessarily have to be a police officer to be a police sketch artist and be a, a good and successful police sketch artist. Some of the best police sketch artists I've worked with are not police officers. They were people who were artists who uh, liked people yeah, and they worked really hard to develop this skill. And, um, you know, there's things that uh, every one of us has an expertise and we know better than the next person. And when we all come together and, and put that expertise together, uh, good things happen. So they may want you to do something in terms of, uh, let's just say, for example, there's a crime where there's six eyewitnesses and the detective wants to pick the one that he thinks is the best. But he's not doing the sketch. You are. So you should be able to interview the six eyewitnesses and determine if you're going to use one, if you're going to use all six, if you're going to use four. That's your expertise as a sketch artist and your role as a consultant, as an investigative resource. You may want to say, hey, you know, bring them all in. Let me talk to them. Let me select the ones I need and whatever. Let me get you that sketch. You select the eyewitness. Uh, you may want to... Um, you may want to uh, consult with them in terms of the tools and techniques that you use in terms of, you know, is a pencil sketch going to be better than a computer software program sketch because the person has a tech phobia. They don't like computers, maybe, you know, so what's going to be best for the case? Uh, you know, you may want to develop interview strategies with them. I get a lot of times um, when I walk out of an interview room, a detective will ask me, do you think the person's lying or not? And, you know, my answer to that is always, well, you know, if, um, if you thought they were lying, maybe I shouldn't be talking to them. Or maybe they, they wanted you to talk to them for a reason because sometimes things come out during a composite sketch interview that the police detective didn't find out because sometimes I talk to the police, I'm sorry, I talk to the eyewitness before the detective does. So I'm able to tell the detective things that, he or she may not, not even know, or things come up um, that cast suspicion on the eyewitness in terms of their veracity. In other words, they may, not, they may not be telling the truth. And your gut instinct, your experience, is going to help you tell the detective uh, facts about the case that might 
uh, keep him and her from chasing their tails and going on a wild goose chase, so to speak. So also you, uh, as your role as a police sketch artist, you're a communications expert. You know, you're a PR person. You're the person um, that's either going to um, keep them engaged in the criminal justice system, the investigative process, or you're going to be the one that causes upset and um, causes them not to want to uh, talk to detectives or anybody. So, you know, you're a representative of the department, uh, whether you're a freelance uh, artist, a volunteer, or you're a member of the department. Uh, you, oftentimes you're going to be a liaison with the advocates and such because it's not going to be uncommon for the victim or the eyewitness to a sexual assault to have an advocate come into the room and sit in on the interview. So it may be that you have a brief meeting with the advocate before you go in there and he or she will tell you about the eyewitness in terms of, you know, um, how to handle them because they spent maybe a little more time with you. I'm sorry, with them than you have at the outset of the uh, situation. And um, it makes it easier for you to communicate with them so you don't turn them off, so to speak. Yeah, because your whole goal is to keep them engaged in the process. When they leave your office and you finish the sketch, you want them to be satisfied with the sketch, uh, knowing that they did the best job that they could on that sketch. Um, and they, uh, they, they may have to testify in court or you yourself may have to testify in court, uh, during the, um, during the ensuing prosecution. And so, um, you want to keep their confidence up because really at the end of the day, you're, um, you're providing some investigative first aid, so to speak. Um, I'm sorry, psychological first aid. Uh, you know, you're, you're putting a bandaid on that wound that they've got, that trauma that they've got, and uh, you're allowing them to confront the person for the first time on paper or on digital tablet um, or, you know, whatever um, it is that it, it is that they've got going on. Um, you're the, you're the person that's going to help them get on the road to healing. So it's really a job um, for people persons. So, um, you know, backing up uh, the story a bit, you know, when I first got involved in this, again, um, you know, a lot of you either are art students, uh, you have a degree in art, uh, you want to find a way to use your art, and I would never diminish a person's ability with having good art skills, but I would rather have a person who has better than average art skills that's a better communicator than someone who's a really great artist, but isn't good with people. You have to, this is, this is more a communications job than it is an art job. And if you can find a way to balance the two together, um, then you're a winner. Um, but you have to like people because it's like I say, there um, it's a very, um, it can be a very heartbreaking, very trying, uh, you know, role sometimes you play, uh, but there's nothing more satisfying um, than feeling like, you know, you're able to use a talent and a skill you have for the greater good of your community and for the greater good of society. So there's that. And of course, when they catch the person and it looks like your sketch, then, it's you, you truly have something extraordinary. So certainly you make the eyewitness feel very empowered uh, when they come in there and talk to you. And of course, you know, the detective who requests you makes you feel empowered because you've got this, this, this supernatural power, so to speak, that, you know, all sorts of wonderful things come out of the tip of your pencil, your stylus and such, and uh, you're able to create these monsters and such. And, uh, you know, you, you give uh, the police something, someone to go out and look for. So, um, as a police sketch artist, you know, one of the main things you're going to do is um, draw composite sketches. Composite sketches is, are probably the most visible uh, police sketch artist tool or skill that's used on a daily basis or a semi-daily basis. And um, something as simple as a number two pencil, an artist pencil, uh, these are two of my favorite pencils right here, and that's Actually, that's my finger right there um, and some of the sketches I've done. But, you know, I, I, I really enjoyed um, drawing. And when I first started sketching, it was um, I didn't need much. You know, um, that's the whole 
this is one of the advantages of having um, doing it the traditional way because the materials are less expensive. I used to just grab a number two pencil, like a school pencil off my desk, sharpen it, and go to the Xerox machine and, and grab a piece of Xerox paper and um, jump into a room and, and interview an eyewitness. It was the materials were cheap. Uh, and these are drawn by, of course, uh, trained police sketch artists. You know, you're working with eyewitnesses uh, or CCTV film or even photographs. Um, and they're effective. I mean, it, if you're still using a pencil or you, you like to use oil pastels, or you like to use chalk, or you like to paint with watercolors to do your crime sketches, great. That's perfect. Um, I would encourage you to do so. But um, again, in a, di in a digital age, when you talk about having to store a drawing, because back in the day, so to speak, before I went digital myself, uh, I would draw a hand sketch. And I would have to give it to that person, the detective. That detective would have to book it into evidence. They'd have to tag it and fill a property receipt, make sure they made a Xerox copy of it or take it to the crime lab to have a photograph taken. It took time. I actually had a detective one time on a weekend. I gave him a sketch and he said, I know this is going to sound pretty stupid. He said, but can you tell me I use a Xerox machine? <laughs> Um, I didn't think it was stupid. I mean, I, I just, I, I don't think he just used it a lot. He wasn't aware. I, I appreciate the fact he asked me, but when you start talking about um, a, a digital solution, apparently I uh, have to get rid of this. Uh, there we go. Okay. So now when we're talking about a digital solution. Now you can, um, if you have a, a, a pen stylus, You've got like, you can do color, you can do black and white, you can use oil, pastel, chalk, pencil, whatever that computer software has within it, um, you can use. So you can see this, um, this, color, this color sketch I made. And so all I have to do now, instead of giving it to the detective to have to fill out a property receipt and sketch as evidence and at risk getting lost, now you can just email it to them as a JPEG, bitmap, PNG, whatever file you prefer, and they can stick it in uh, a digital vault where you store your photographs to maintain the integrity of the evidence of those um, images. Um, or you can uh, easily uh, copy and paste it into a wanted bulletin. So you take the time between a, um, a digital sketch and a hand-drawn sketch, and you're, just, you're, just, um, you're changing the workflow and you're streamlining the workflow, so to speak. And like the traditional sketches, they're lead generators, again, drawn by trained police sketch artists using a digital painting software and a digital pen tablet or display. Again, you're working with eyewitnesses, you're working with CCTV film or still photographs. Uh, and to me, um, when I made the conversion uh, to digital in 2015, it's been five years, I've been working with a, a, a digital medium to create my sketches and such. Uh, it's helped make me not only a better artist, but it's made me more efficient. And again, it streamlined my workflow. So the job is that much easier now and gives me the opportunity to try techniques and things that just enhance the work. Um, so no, some you know, smart aleck news anchor is not gonna sit there and make fun of my drawings. I want drawings that are accurate, that are as accurate as the eyewitnesses can remember using techniques that are gonna cause the police and other people to want to go out and look for that person. Um, I can take a good joke like anybody else, but I'd rather you know, have them not deface my drawing and draw mustaches on it and you know, cartoon uh, word bubbles and stuff like that uh, because they thought it was funny looking or they didn't like the way it looked and such. And um, you know, a lot of times you're at the mercy of the eyewitness, which is fine because again, you know, cognitive perception and such being what it is, um, you know, things are going to look uh, perceptually, um, you know, um, spacing, you know, spatial relationship wise being facial features and such. Sometimes uh, the eyebrows can be a little bit more pushed together than they really are in real life uh, or the distance between the, the tip of the no or the bottom of the nose and the upper lip and such is they're almost going to be sitting on top of each other. And, uh, but you have to draw them how they seem regardless, but um, a digital solution really uh, gives the opportunity to, to, um, really expand your skills and such. 
And these are a couple examples of, uh, for those who aren't familiar, but I think a lot of people are starting to, to pick up and use this, a graphic tablet. Uh, they come in a variety of sizes, uh, 11 inches, as small as 11 or 10, 11 inches, all the way up to, uh, I think Wacom makes a 32 inch uh, behemoth uh, model now. Uh, it takes up half the room, they're huge. But you can draw directly on screen. You connect it to a laptop or a desktop, and you can use it as a secondary monitor. Uh, but the cool thing is you can draw directly on screen. So you see what you're drawing uh, real time, so to speak. A pen tablet, it connects to a computer. It's portable. Um, it's a lot less expensive. It does the same thing. The only thing is, is as you draw on the tablet, you have to look up and look at your monitor. Uh, so you really have to work on getting a hand-eye coordination uh, thing going, so to speak. So it takes some practice, but it doesn't take much. It doesn't take long. Uh, and so for a lot of people, you know, if, if they have a big budget or the police department buys it for them, a big graphic tablet like this is, is great to have. Um, pen tablet, you know, if your budget's a little bit lower and you just want to throw it in your laptop bag and go, then uh, this is a great solution as well. Uh, they're They're getting to the point where both uh, the less expensive version, the expensive version has uh, uh, over 8,000 uh, pressure sensitive uh, styluses, the precision at which they draw and such, and the software that they're using them with and, and such, um, make them both a great solution. Right now, I um, do a lot of remote work, so uh, the great thing about remote sketch interviews is that the uh, turnaround time is much faster and uh, we're allowed to, um, you know, we, we can call eyewitnesses any time of day, no matter where they're at in the world. And they can be anywhere, uh, their office, their home. Uh, it's pretty much limitless. And so you're looking at the, the desktop of uh, the system I use. I use either Zoom or ClickMeeting. And uh, you'll see the, the company logo there and uh, my screen share with the eyewitness. And of course, um, you can see a little picture of me like what you're seeing here. Uh, so that you have that, um, that personal connection, so to speak. They can see, you know, most of the time, most people have cameras on their laptops or phones and such. So I can see them, they can see me. So there's not that mystery and such. So I've uh, been very successful at using this uh, remotely. And if you live in a big country and you're like one of the, uh, one of the you know handful of sketch artists and says sending you all the way across the state or all the way across the country uh, you can uh, connect uh, via zoom or one of the other platforms out there and conduct a similar uh, interview to what you do if you're uh, on site or sitting in front of the person in, a, in an office and such so uh, now with smartphones and smartphone apps it makes it easier than ever a good majority of the sketches i do now um, are strictly on people's smartphones. Uh, again, like I said earlier, people are busy. Um, they don't always have time to meet you. They're always on the run. They're between classes. They're going to work. They got kids. They got, you know, so oftentimes, you know, they can download the uh, web conferencing app, whether it's Zoom or whether it's the other one I use, ClickMeeting, and uh, they can bring it up on their phone. And even though it's fairly small, they're still seeing the same desktop as this one here. Same program, just a different medium. A little bit small, you can zoom up here and there, but um, it makes it easier. So even people, you know, they talk about this digital divide where people don't have, you know, uh, desktop computers, they don't have, um, you know, internet connections or hotspots. Most phone services these days, when people get a phone plan, they're getting internet service. So anywhere there's a hotspot, whether it's a Starbucks or a university or a neighborhood somewhere, they can just log in and and, and get a sketch done. So it really uh, makes things a lot easier these days in this interconnected world that we're in. Now the software driven solution. This is the thing that it, it's kind of one of these touchy subjects because, you know, police composite sketch artists are, they're proud of their art skills. They prefer to draw it than have to deal with a, a software driven solution like um, our software sketch Cop facial composite system software. Um, they'd rather do it themselves. Um, and you know, you know, the, the software wasn't necessarily made for police sketch artists. They were made to fill the gap uh, where there were areas where there wasn't a lot of police sketch artists. The problem was 
is that the database of facial features oftentimes was very poor. The training was non-existent. So people didn't like using the software or they didn't trust using the software. Um, but it didn't mean that there wasn't a need to fill. So I got involved um, and said, you know, if, if we're going to do something, we're going to do something um, that's simple, direct, with an easy user interface um, that doesn't create, you know, a lot of fuss for people to, you know, create their own sketches. Because again, not everyone's an artist. Um, again, the artist would say, well, they can't do what I can do. And that may have been true 30 years ago, but these days with Photoshop and pen tablets and software driven solutions. Yeah. A person who's computer savvy works really hard. Who is not an artist per se can create successful composites. Um, so these are really important because people who may have marginal art skills or don't have any art skills, but still want to participate and do something. They, they think it's kind of something that has a value they like to do. They can take the training and learn the software and, and, and create really good sketches and such. So the, uh, the advantage with the software driven solutions like the SketchCop facial composite system software is that they're cost effective. Uh, you can train more people for less money uh, than it takes to train a traditional sketch artist and keep them up on their skills. It's a 24 seven solution. So, uh, you know, when you're training a lot of people in your police department, um, there's no time that there's not going to be somebody on duty or available to use the software to create a sketch. Uh, and it provides real-time intelligence because everything is all about now providing real-time intelligence. Um, they want to know now, um, you know, what the, uh, they, they, they want to get the information, you know, in their hand as quickly as possible. So um, I would say that uh, a facial composite is every bit as good of intelligence, criminal intelligence, as is uh, crime statistics or crime locations and such. So, um, I think it's important as a um, intelligence tool. Uh, plus it reduces investigative cycle times. I mean, you want to use your time uh, to work on, you know, uh, to work on cases and, and use that, uh, you know, the money and resources and such for other things as well. Um, so really uh, the more hands you can get this sketch uh, or the more people you get this in the hands of they're out there, you increase the opportunity to identify and arrest the suspect and again, uh, save money uh, by reducing that investigative cycle time. Again, here's a, an example of, of some facial composites using a computer. Um, these are actual sketch artists. So you have the um, sketch here in the middle and then you have um, some artists, forensic artists down in South America who actually um, built a similar sketch using the sketch cop system and then use some uh, digital software to touch it up uh, to make it look even more like a sketch. So this is, uh, as a matter of fact, this is the desktop uh, for our software program and um, everything is on the user interface, easy to use. You know, you know, your eyewitness picks out a selection of facial features here and you click on it and build a sketch here in the center. You got your editing tools over here. Uh, you can go into an editor. You can be you can create sketches in color, black and white. You can print them out. You can do a multi view where you can do six different uh, looks of a suspect. So uh, it's easy to use. It's cost effective, and again, we can teach anyone how to use this. You can get various you can get various ethnicities. Uh, you know, uh, you can manipulate the features to make it look like. Uh, whatever ethnic base you're looking for. And again, we're, we're building the database all the time. So we're adding more uh, ethnic parts to it so we can create sketches from anybody around the world. And this is what I'm talking about. This is just basic sketch with the sketch cop software. And then if you take an artist who is um, flexible enough to want to use the software, they can use some of the digital tools and their art skills to push that composite even further and make it even look more like what the suspect looks like and create some satisfaction with your eyewitness. You don't want your eyewitness to walk out of the office saying, well, the sketch is close enough. That's the best that the database would do. That's the best that the sketch software could do. We want them to walk and say, yeah, that looks like the person who attacked me. So some of the other things uh, a sketch artist 
we'll work on a police sketch artist, we'll post more to images. Again, everything you'll see, lead generators, lead generators, lead generators. These things, these pictures, whether it's a, a sketch of a suspect, a sketch of a, a deceased person who's been a homicide victim, you don't know who their name, what their name is. And we all know that most people are killed by someone they know, so the quicker you identify this person, the more likely it is to lead to a suspect. It's all about generating leads, getting that phone call, generating information. Uh, created by an artist or a trained technician, uh, someone with or without art skills. Uh, you can use photo editing, uh, paint, or il or paint and illustration software uh, to take a mortar or crime scene photo as a starting point uh, to create. Um, yeah, this, these are two different people. They're not the same people. <laughs> uh, but this is an example of a sketch I did of, of, of mixing a, a photograph in a, in a sketch of an unknown deceased person. Now we've got modeling software, uh, 3D modeling software, where you can take a CT scan or a DICOM file, or a DICOM file from a CT scan, and then you can um, create a 3D model and then import that into a virtual clay sculpting software, 3D software. Uh, it minimizes damage to the skull. You don't have to ship the skull to the artist. You don't have to worry about it being damaged, lost. You don't have to worry about um, any type of anybody getting sick or disease or sick. Um, it minimizes physical contact. Um, you can take, you can supplement the skull scan with high definition photos for the artist to work with. And it really, at the end of the day, because that skull is evidence, it helps preserve the evidence and such. And once you create that skull model, you can import it into and sculpt uh, the person's face. This is a case I'm working on right now, actually. Now, the great thing is, is you can, uh, if you take a regular skull, you sculpt clay on top of it, you lose any, any view of that skull that you have. You're not going to see that skull. Uh, with this, I can push a button, I can uh, hit transparency, and I can see through that clay and look at different places on the skull. Uh, the different uh, bony parts of the skull to make sure that uh, you know I'm still following the landmarks and still following the tissue depth markers and other marks I made on the skull. You can't see it here, but there's little red dots I made in terms of um, uh, little markers I need to keep in mind when I was doing the sculpting and such. So that's uh, one of the advantages of 3D. You can print them out and make 3D models of them. There's a lot of variation. Again, there's a lot of things you can do, and then you can color them or you can keep them looking as a, as a clay. Again, you know, 3D sculpting software programs, 3D laser scans, uh, CT scans. You just get that image of the skull and upload it. Um, you don't have to spend the time cutting and, and gluing tissue depth markers on the skull because now you can uh, create a file of tissue depth markers and just change the links depending upon what your anthropologist tells you uh, about the, the sex, uh, race, ethnicity, build, you know, approximate age of the person. Also, a uh, police sketch artist, forensic artist, whatever you want to call yourself, um, you know, missing persons in fugitive cases doing age progressions. Again, you know, created by artists or trained technicians, software programs, using personal photos or government ID. This is an actual murder suspect um, where they had me age the person. So from this booking photo, I was able to age the person uh, using a, uh, you know, blending it with other photographs and using uh, some photo editing software to uh, create this new look of this person. One-to-one -one photo comparison and analysis. Um, this is where you're taking a picture, taking uh, that and, and putting it against, uh, comparing it next to the uh, photo of the known person to determine if in fact is likely they're the same people. You can see these um, numbers I put on here. Um, to identify the different uh, morphological uh, features that I found to be similar in my examination of this person who was one of the uh, escapees from Alcatraz prison. Um, so that's another thing that um, more, it's more technician driven. A lot of fingerprint experts uh, do this. A lot of other uh, types of examiners who are used to looking at detailed images and such. Uh, get training on how to do one-to-one -one photo comparison and analysis. And this was a lecture I gave uh, with the support of Dr. Singh a few months ago. 
uh, there in India at one of the uh, trainings they were having on the photo comparison analysis. It's something that's become more in use these days with uh, a lot of the CCTV camera images out there, which um, this is one of the things that, you know, you, you, you have to start somewhere. And I started out as a police sketch artist. And I went from drawing composite sketches, which I still do, to learning how to do facial reconstruction, to learning how to age progress. And now I'm learning how to compare photos and such because there's just um, CCTV cameras that have cut a lot into um, the work of police sketch artists because there's camera footage of everybody around there. Uh, they're more prevalent than ever. Unfortunately, you're not always getting a good picture from a CCTV scan. So um, my guess is, is that this detective said, I don't need a sketch. I've got this CCTV uh, image. Um, you cannot see any facial details. Uh, could you identify this person? Uh, maybe by the clothes she wore, uh, maybe by the way she stood. But this picture with the composite sketch next to it would be a real powerful image in terms of helping increase the identification. So. Also, DNA profiles. Uh, DNA is big. It's identifying a lot of people, uh, cracking a lot of cold cases. Uh, they're creating composite sketches from DNA profiles, which um, you know, they solve some cases, but this has been pretty controversial because a lot of DNA experts will tell you that they can predict the face shape, the skin tone, the eye color, uh, freckles, but I'm trying to figure out how they come up with the rest of this in here if it's just... I don't know how they come up with it. So... Um, but there's a lot of controversy about this. It has solved cases. It is expensive. It costs several thousand dollars to get one of these done. Um, but, you know, it's another resource that's out there that, again, is impacting the work of police sketch artists. So, if you don't have DNA, uh, well, then you have to have a sketch. You should resort to a police composite sketch. And this is... Um, this is a case uh, that I did several years ago. A five-year-old girl was playing uh, in her apartment complex with her best friend, another five-year-old. And a man came up and, and took this beautiful child. And she was found um, murdered a couple days later. But her five-year-old friend sat down and helped me construct this sketch. There was no evidence. There was no DNA. There was no fingerprints. There was nothing. He come and grabbed her and left. People saw this sketch. Two different people called in, gave the same name. Police picked him up. At the scene of the crime where they found her body dumped after he murdered her, this is the person they identified. The five-year-old girl did a phenomenal job describing this person to me. They found tire tracks, a bare footprint, a shoe print. They found his car with DNA from her tears as she cried on the armrest, skin under her fingernails. So while, while there wasn't DNA and fingerprints and tire tracks at the front end of the case, it was the sketch that, leaded, that led police to that. So you're not always going to have the evidence leads you to the suspect as much as the sketch leads you to the evidence who leads you to the suspect. So you still need that sketch regardless of if you've got DNA or CCTV images and such. So always think sketch. I'm a little biased myself, but you know, spent a better part of my life doing it. So try and look at the clock here, make sure I don't overrun my time here. Getting close here. Okay, so my final thoughts here. Um, I'm trying to create a renaissance period here for police sketch artists. I want to encourage law enforcement agencies to start using sketches more. Despite uh, what you hear about eyewitnesses and their unreliability, despite people saying, well, I've got a, a, a camera image uh, that was taken up from a corner of a store 40 feet away where you can't see the face. Um, and part of this is going to be fueled by a paradigm shift. In other words, perception and attitude. This can be up to you to take this training, to learn these skills, to take it to the detective and say, hey, I've got this great skill. Let's try using it. And give them a better understanding of the rewards and benefits of using a police sketch. This will be done through better training, you know, and better tools to use. So don't ever be reluctant to use um, you know, new techniques, new tools. Um, you, know, you know, software may not be for you. The 
you know, the software driven approach, approach like our SketchCop facial composite system software. Um, but I actually talked to a, a young lady one day that was a crime scene investigator and she was a, a hand, a traditional sketch artist too. She said, you know, she goes, I enjoy drawing, but I don't always have time to do a sketch because of my primary job. So I like to use the software because I can use the software it's quicker and I can touch it up with my art skills and such and then get back to my regular job. And that's fine. Be open, be flexible, uh, use what tools the best for the job. Um, and that's important to have the buy-in from the friends of art community as well. Her opinion was very important to me in terms of representing a new way of thinking um, because they'll never be out of a job. Uh, the, the software may impact how many sketches they do, but they'll always be able to do 3D uh, facial reconstructions, the one-to-one -one, uh, comparisons and analysis, they become the quality assurance people and the trainers for this group of computer artists. Um, they assist with training. Uh, they use their high degree of art skills to do some of the special jobs and such that um, the software may not be suited for. Uh, but I look at um, this renaissance and police sketches and, and, and training more sketch artists and getting more software out there is creating a class of forensic facial technician, much like a fingerprint technician or crime scene investigator. Now we've got the forensic facial technician who may or may not have art skills, but is computer savvy and understands computers and knows technology, how to use the software and how to adapt it and how to integrate it into the investigations. And now with, um, Facial recognition technology is more important than ever that we get these facial reconstructions into these systems, these police sketches and these software driven sketches and such, uh, and utilize that facial recognition technology in terms of, you know, getting several matches and probable candidates to give police something to follow up and such. So it's all about generating leads and getting that intelligence out there and uh, getting a name, getting a name and then using some of the positive ID the types of sciences to confirm that lead that was generated from the facial image. So uh, I think we're getting close to the question and answer period here. Um, it's been almost an hour and a half. Um, so um, if you'd like, you can email me at this email address here, contact at sketchcop.com, or you can contact, uh, you can uh, contact Dr. Singh to get a hold of me as well. Uh, those of you who um, are on LinkedIn, uh, can look up Michael W. Street and connect with me on LinkedIn. So you got my email address there, copy it down and grab your phone and uh, look me up on LinkedIn. And also on Facebook, on Instagram, and on tweet, uh, Twitter, tweet, um, you can follow me at the Sketch Cop. So if you want to grab your phone now and go to your social media and uh, like my page or uh, make a friend request, Follow, start following me, you can do that as well. And also, I just started a YouTube channel. And uh, so if you want to go to YouTube and look up the Sketch Cop channel, uh, hit the subscribe button and uh, subscribe and uh, we can connect. So I appreciate you taking the time. I mean, I can't tell you how much this means to me to be able to um, have this sort of global reach, thanks to Dr. Singh and the uh, Sherlock Institute of Forensic Science. Uh, you've been a great audience. You've been very attentive. I look forward to questions. I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Singh if you want to jump in and take over and uh, open up the question and answer period. I hope to hear from you folks. I hope to connect with you. I hope uh, to train you someday. And I hope you can uh, uh, pick up when I leave off. So thank you very, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Michael, for taking a wonderful session. And definitely the audience has benefited from such a wonderful session. So I'm just going to take a few questions from uh, audience, those who wants to ask a question. They have a question, they have raised a hand also. So I'll take a one by one question because uh, it's very difficult to take all the questions, but I'll try to take the maximum questions so that okay. uh, we can have a good discussion. I have all the time you need. Uh, we have, as per the timing, we have a, uh, uh, like we do not have much timing, but I'll try to take maximum questions. Okay. Okay. So the question I like to take from uh, Avichal Sena. I'm just going to unmute you. You can ask your question. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot, Dr. Ranjit and Michael for this wonderful session. And uh, my question is, uh, uh, I am into legal consulting. So my uh, perspective is from the legal side. 
uh, how far it is critical to classify this police sketch into substantive or corroborative evidence because you know so that it is evident that the accused has uh, you know is a real culprit and uh, he does not walk away after committing the crime yeah you know that's a good question because i have only in the in 40 years of doing this i probably only testified less than a dozen times um and most of the time what will happen is if a sketch goes to court and if it looks close enough to the suspect the defense attorney is going to want to just stipulate to the fact that that probably looks like the suspect and, and keep it out of the jury because if the jury is allowed to see it and see how close it looks like the suspect, then it's more perilous for him in terms of a guilty finding. Um, so they have a tendency to rely more on the um, less subjective evidence like fingerprints and DNA uh, than they do a sketch. If that makes sense. Yeah. Next question I like to take from C uh, dot F, CFE dot Kamal. So I'm just unmuting you. You just ask your questions. And for other participants, it's very difficult to read all the question on the chat box. So definitely, uh, I'll read all the questions in the meantime, and we'll try to write all the answer in a blog, so you can get all your answer. So, sir, a question to you. I think he is not audible. So I'm giving a chance to Ritu. Ritu, can you ask your question? Got some, got some shy people here. Yeah. Vivek? Yeah. My, hello? Yeah, very hello. Thank, hello. Thanks Hi, to, for your uh, kind words and very informative lecture given by you. My question you. is, my question is, I am a professor of law. Uh, I want to know what is the evidentiary value in, it, in the courts of law of these sketches? Well, it's, it's oftentimes, uh, like I said to the previous uh, uh, lawyer, is that, you know, these are very uh, strong visual pieces of evidence, especially if, um, if they look very similar to the suspect or the defendant. Um, they're very powerful visuals for juries, and juries have a tendency to um, view them very favorably. So a lot of times... Um, they're not going to want to call the sketch artist in to testify because that means that piece of evidence that sketch is going to get into court. So they've got a, a very strong weight here in the United States, at least in terms of a person's, you know, probable guilt or, or innocence. Uh, but they're becoming used less and less. Yeah. Uh, Dorcas, you can ask your question. Um, I wanted to know the age limit for which, um, um, evidence can be taken from an eyewitness. Like in the case of the child, you were saying that the child was five years old. Can that, uh, is there any age limit or anybody else can uh, can give information with regards to who they saw on the crime scene? That's a great question. Um, I, don't, I don't interview anybody younger than five. Um, and I've, I've interviewed people as old as in their early 90s. Um, the Unabomber sketch uh, was done eight years after the crime. So um, there's no real time limit in terms of when you, when you interview somebody for a sketch, the sooner the better. But in terms of age, I wouldn't go any younger than five. And then I'll interview somebody as, as old as, like I say, if, if they can still speak and remember and they're 100 years old, I'll interview them. There's no limit in terms of, in terms of uh, age range. Yeah, Amit, you can ask your question. Joya Singh. Mm -hmm. 
Joya Singh, please ask your question. Hemant Kumar Panda, sir. Hemant, sir. Michael, they are audible to you? No, I, I don't hear anything. Okay. Oscar. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mike. Uh, thank you, Oscar. Yeah, my question is, uh, what makes a good eyewitness? Uh, in our client, not many people can actually give vivid descriptions. Are there public awareness trainings that can be, be shared? That's my question. Thank you. I, th I think that... Um I think that there's the people are better eyewitnesses than people give them credit for. We we have to um, we have to train people how to be better interviewers. Like whether they're police detectives or police sketch artists, there's techniques that you can use to reach people, to encourage them to remember things that they don't think that they can remember. Uh, they have a they have a very low confidence in themselves. Maybe they don't want to get involved. Maybe they're afraid of retribution. There's a lot of things. So, you know, assessing somebody's value as an eyewitness and how good an eyewitness they are is a very careful process. Um, but I think that there's probably uh, the witnesses that you're talking about are probably better uh, than people give them credit for. It's just a matter of, of having that proper training and spending the proper time with them. Yeah. Ayodeji? Uh, Dr. Aman Chaudhary. Uh, uh, can, can you hear me? Uh, yes, uh, audible, sir. Please ask. Okay. Uh, I have, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for such a great lecture which you have given Dr. Ranjit and uh, Dr. Michael, you have arranged. Uh, now, uh, I have two heads uh, of, uh, of questions which I would like to ask. One is that uh, no standard, uh, any standard literature which you suggest for facial proportions and uh, these kind of 2D reconstructions, one. Because I, I see Karen Taylor very famous in this and uh, uh, various books which are available now. Uh, they are all contradicting and pointing in different directions. One. And second thing which I wanted to know is how to maintain a balance between science and art in this. Because if I try too much of science, it becomes a little, you know, uh, less of artistic. And when I try too much of art, it becomes too much of a, a beautiful face which does not resemble the real one. Uh, you know, that's a great question because I was... I'm working, on, I'm working on a case now on a 3D facial reconstruction, and I'm looking at some literature on how to, the different techniques to create a nose. And I, I must have read about three or four different techniques on how to uh, sculpt the nose. But they all, they're all contradictory. Uh, one is no better than the other. And so like you, I try to follow the science. Uh, and I follow the science far enough to get the shape and the form I need. And then what I do is I will find the out when the person was probably killed or buried or died. And I'll go back and look at resources like high school annuals or different uh, booking photos and different things to show typical hairstyles and typical dress. And I try to add a little bit of personality to that, to that reconstruction. Now, people may say that's wrong. Um, but you know, some people have done that very well because sometimes you need to add that personality and that artistic license, like you say, to create that recognition and to, to bring to life that image that you're reconstructing. So I, I'm, I'm, I agree with you, Aman, totally. You have to just kind of walk that line and just trust your gut. Follow the science, but also don't be afraid to add a little flair to it as well to give that personality, that look. Yeah. Yes. Uh, good morning. Um, uh, first of all, please. Um, I'm sorry. I I joined the webinar late because in Italy it is a little bit different in time. I enjoyed uh, only half of your webinar. It was very very re very exciting from the point of view of the identification. My question is, Michael. 
What about the identification of disease? You have been describing post-mortem sketches of people that are died. Uh, in your experience, how, um, how can this work? I mean, in percentage, how many cases have you have solved autonomously through the sketch or uh, it is a tool that you give over to pathologists and odontologists? Well, you know, that's a great question. Um, I think if the odontologist has the artistic skills or the technical know-how to use software and like Photoshop and such to, to, um, to add the eyes and you know, reopen the eyes and uh, close the mouth and, and reanimate that image to make them look uh, like they're alive, then, then that's great because you've got that scientific background and that anatomical, that anatomy expertise uh, to be able to properly illustrate it. Um, and then again, of course, you know, if a, if a forensic artist is smart, they'll work with a, a person like yourself and work as a team, so to speak, because when you do a facial reconstruction, unlike a police sketch where you're working one-on-one -on -one with an eyewitness, I look at most either a post-mortem image or a facial reconstruction from a skull as a multidisciplinary team effort with odontologists, pathologists, um, forensic anthropologists, all submitting information to that artist and helping guide that artist in which direction to go. So what about, and I think- um, Michael, what about, because we have cases that from our side of odontology, we have cases where we have been able to uh, recognize some missing person using uh, the front teeth as uh, partic with particular features. Sometimes mm -hmm. we ask for selfies or portrait pictures. In your experience, have you faced situations where the cases were solved through the dental features of a smile, let's say? I have not, uh, but I'm always, um, I'm always um, careful to make sure I show any unusual dentition or any unusual like the, uh, like a front chip tooth. Um, I want to make sure I open up that mouth and if they have a diastema to, to be able to show that. Anything that's unusual with dentition, you want to open that mouth up somehow. And because yeah. um, that you're right, that's going to be a huge identifier. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you very much, doctor. Yeah, as we have a, a time, uh, we have a close to the time, but I like to take a last question from Dr. S uh, Sanjay Samron, uh, sir. Sanjay sir, uh, he is not any Mabel. Thank you very much, um, sir. In yes. my jurisdiction, as a legal, I'm talking as a legal practitioner. And in my jurisdiction, you can take a witness of a child especially a child below the age of 14 years may not be able to swear in, in and without swearing such person in the evidence given may not be tenable. Depends on the scenario, but there are so many few cases whereby such a child may be able to give evidence and it will be tenable. Now, if a five years old, if a sketch is based on the five years old description, how tenable can such be in the courts? Like, what, what evidential value will he give? Because it may not work. I, I like him to expatiate more on that. How can we use it? Is there a way we can come in and tender it and it will help the case? Thank you. Sure, of course. No, uh, and a lot of it, um, a lot of it uh, is different from country to country, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. But I think uh, there's certain... Um, legal tests that they have in terms of, of a child's uh, reliability or their, uh, their cognitive abilities to be able to testify as a witness. And one of the things I did not talk about is a lot of times, you know, I'll use um, people's words and I'll also show them examples of photographs so they can select different photographs and such. I do that with children. I do that with adults and such. So their words are backed up by them selecting pictures that we put together like a puzzle as a template to create that final sketch and such. So um, I think that um, I don't think that um, there's a question of their reliability, especially if the person looks like the sketch 
or there's some other element of their testimony that leads them to the, the suspect. So um, I, I don't think you should be afraid to use children. Um, if you don't, um, they just have to be very carefully questioned, examined, and prepared for testimony before they go to court. Yeah, and the last question from the Avril. All right. Um, hi, Michael. That was very nice. I wanted to uh, find out uh, with the digital software like CPBS, did mm -hmm. they put into consideration the facial uh, features of people in like African region? Because we have some African regions that, because I'm thinking about the viability of this software on a larger scale. So, for example, if I want to use the CPBS in Nigeria, how efficient would it be? Did they put into consideration fa uh, facial features of people in Africa? Well, I can tell you that in terms of the CPBS, that's a um, software that was developed specifically um, for Indian law enforcement. I can tell you that the software that my company developed, SketchCop Facial Composite System, does have African American uh, features uh, that are that would probably do well in Africa in terms of uh, factually representing different African uh, uh, types and such uh, in terms of creating suspect sketches. So I think any I think any software, whether it's the uh, India's uh, CPBS or our software or any of the other ones on the market, there uh, they're only limited by the training of the person and the understanding of the, the technology of the person using it. So uh, coming to the end, uh, it was completely my pleasure to have a lecture from the Michael again. And uh, in future, we are going to definitely arrange uh, such more lecture and the training. Uh, although we have a time limitation, that's why we are not able to take all the participant at a question. But my request to all the participants, you can write your question to, through the email by which you receive the invitation, the password, and the ID. And after reading all the question, we'll make a blog or a questionnaire, a frequently asked question. And uh, I'll take all the answer from the Michael, then we'll publish on a web and share the link with you. Or we can share, make a video of that and we can share with you. So although we are in a virtually, thank you, Michael, once again for taking a session. But as for the uh, like uh, uh, things, I like to uh, thank you for taking a uh, lecture and uh, Thank you all the participants from different country, police department, forensic science laboratory, university, students, and all for participating here. And uh, I request Michael to accept a certificate uh, for presenting this wonderful lecture. So Thank you. Michael, this is a certificate up for you, although we are in a virtual, but- Thank you very much. As an uh, actual certificate. Thank you. Thank you, much appreciated. And I'm looking forward to all the exciting things we're gonna be doing together. So you all will receive the registration participants uh, certificate you will receive. Thank you, Michael. I'm saying goodbye to everyone. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Goodbye, everybody. Everybody have a great day. Be safe. Do like and comment your reviews. Subscribe Forensic 365 for more videos and updates.